Hello again, folks, and this is the second of our double bill of shows today, because if you were around this morning, we did that wonderful one about um, the Guadalcanal and Chesty Puller of the Marines, but that was um, fantastic. But we're back to Special Forces Week now, and the thing about this unit that we're discussing today is there'll be some of you watching who have heard of this unit, and some of you who won't heard of the unit. There's certain units like the SAS, the world has heard of the SAS, Navy SEALs, but today's unit kind of have some fame and yet they're still not known so well so which means that sometimes myths get out there because there's a big connecting factor with today's show and it is ian fleming and ian fleming has come up in our dieppe shows frequently he's come up because ian fleming seems to have a connection with every kind of aspect of intelligence special forces and all root roots lead to ian fleming in some shape or form so that will be something we're going to be talking about today but my guest Dave Roberts, uh, heavily interested in 30AU, also works at the Western Approaches Museum, so Navy and all that side of things as well, which he'll be coming back on to talk about at some point in the future. But without further ado, I'll introduce him to the show. Before I just last one thing, don't forget to click like. If you like what we're doing, always click like there on YouTube because it helps with the algorithm to get more viewers in. So I'm going to bring Dave in now. So good evening, Dave. How are you? Hi, Paul. Yeah, good. Thank you. Yeah. So 30 Assault Unit, 30 AU, we will talk about the fact their name has different kind of variations on a theme as one of our 10 talking points. But before we get into that, how did you get, how did you hear about the unit and how did you, why did you decide to investigate it further? So uh, it all came about through, through Nick Rankin's book. And I had always had a fascination for, for units that were a little bit quirky, a little bit out of the ordinary. I wasn't one for for the big units the, the popular ones so found nick's book read it and thought got to find out more about this unit um found the website got heavily involved in that found the facebook groups and it's just snowballed from there really um to the extent that i sort of jointly run the groups in the website um have managed to to locate some of the few very few surviving veterans but more to do with their families as well and sharing stories and allowing people their, those relatives to find out a little bit more about what their the fathers their uncles their grandfathers actually did because it, it was a very secret unit yeah and, and you know you said there about the, the ranking book which i have a copy of i mean if you if you were interested in the sas i mean there are probably dozens of books you could bought about the sas over their 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 service from world war ii right up the present day and other units similarly but this unit there was the Sean Bean movie that we won't be talking about, particularly that came out yeah, about yeah. 10 years ago that, that probably did more harm than good. No offense, Mr. Bean. Um, but, um, you know, it, it is a unit that, as you have done with your website, and by the way, folks, the link to the, 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 the website is in the description below, that, that has benefited from deeper a deeper dive to research it because the, the work hadn't really been done. No, that's right. And it's like any topic, when you dig deeper and deeper into it, you suddenly find that there are, there are books out there, but most of them were written, you know, a long time ago. And some of them were written before a lot, a lot of the archives were actually officially released. Um, and more information's come to light, more more stories about the individuals have, have come to light. There were the big, big names in the unit that everybody knew, but more about sort of the ordinary men has, has started to come to light. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's one of those things where you, you you end up in it and you you just follow whatever path you you take and you just find out more and more and you just end up becoming more fascinated with it yeah the the the, the light at the end of the tunnel just keeps getting further and further away exactly. and as we'll discuss yeah. tonight with the with the more blowing things up units there was no need to conceal some of what they did because it was a public interest during the war so the lrdg if they've blown up rommel's oil supplies it's headline news, but as we will find out with, with 30 AU, they were doing stuff in terms of finding out about enemy technology, intelligence that couldn't be released to the public, not in the war and not for some years after war, which obviously shrouds the whole organization in a bit of a bit of secrecy and, and mystery. And then add the Ian Fleming level of kind of intrigue, it gets all a bit complicated. But yeah. the point is, folks, we're gonna go through these 10 facts that everybody should know, and we're not gonna announce what they are. We'll go along as we go through them, and after we finish the show. I will add the 10 points to the description, but we're going to do it freestyle right now. And Dave's come supplied with a, with a PowerPoint. So um, I think we're starting off with their name and, uh, and what it means and who they are. Yeah. So if we jump to the first, to the next slide, um, and th this probably, that's probably the, the most, 
most that's be the image that most people recognize and that that badge um symbolized 30 assault unit it was worn on the on the sleeves of the the battle dress um and that that alone caused them an ever, an ever increasing amount of problems um, serving in Northwest Europe because you had um, sailors running around in blue peak caps with army battle dress with 30 on their sleeves in Royal Navy. And you came across an American unit and very often they thought you were rather a poor imitation of Germans trying to dress up as British and trying to sort of get behind enemy lines. So there was some definitely some scary moments. but. When it was created, it what didn't even have a number. It didn't even have a, a, a number of, of, of what it was. So Fleming suggested this idea of an intelligence assault unit whose sole aim was to assault areas to gather intelligence, just like the name name said. Um, that, for secrecy purposes, was named the Special Engineering Unit. Um, in typical British fashion, give it a name that's completely random and completely, you know, um, away from what it actually does. Um, it then morphed into 30 Commando, but it soon became obvious that a unit which never at that point exceeded sort of 30 to 40 men couldn't be considered to be a commando when you had the, the, the larger commando units within the Special Service Brigade and so on of, of 40, 40 World Commando and the rest of it. Then we get to the start of uh, 44 and 30 is um, a, a vital part, a major part of Operation Overlord. And that's where it's seen as, as vital there. And that's where it's given this new badge and the new title 30 Assault Unit. It does morph right at the end of the war into something called 30 Advanced Unit. Um, but that's, you know, that that's the progression of the of the name and it's referred to in various various contexts and, and various um variations of that the number 30 bizarrely came from the secretary's door it was her room in the admiralty um so there's you know people come up with all sorts of theories as to why it was but it was simply because it was miss Priestley's um room in the admiralty and she happened to be the secretary to the dni at the time and and, well, and that's a, just a great bit of trivia to start us off. But you know, as we've been talking about on this week and other shows, is that in those early years of special forces, particularly in, in with with Commonwealth for you know forty one, forty two, there's lots of morphing of of units being conceived for one reason, but then a little bit down the line, they change their name and their focus shifts to something else. So they go from kind of ground mounted to airborne or airborne to behind the lines and. And, and that's you know the, the one that the ones that were still standing in forty four were the ones that a proved that they could do what they was they said they would do and b had been adaptable enough to kind of survive the shakeup because our armies are learning what to do with special forces. We essentially went into World War II without them, and then we have to decide what works with them and what doesn't work with them. And in this intelligence gathering side of things, as we will find out, that they they became very good at it. So um, yeah, fascinating stuff. Yeah, um, they they also earned themselves a huge amount of, of various nicknames as they went through. Um, Robert Neville, uh, head of the Combined Ops Planning Committee, when he when they were first created, he he described them as a as a unit that would be armed and expert looters. Um, so that, you know that that gives you some idea as to what their um, raison d'être was. Uh, Fleming famously referred to them as his politically incorrect Red Indians. Um, they. Uh, some of their behavior, the Marines earned the name the Indecent Assault Unit um, during their time in in France because of the uh, the uh, relations with some of the ladies that they met, some of the French ladies. Um, and General Patton came across them on several occasions. He first met them in North Africa and then in Sicily. Um, never took to them at all. They uh, they tended to be a thorn in his side. One of the reasons being that they never wore the, the steel helmets. Marines didn't he refused to wear their steel helmets in his areas and he just referred to them as a bunch of armed limey gangsters um yeah. which they probably would have liked to be honest <laughs> yeah, it's, it's yeah a, i think they probably took that as a compliment yeah there are worse things to be called isn't it <laughs> yeah. and, you know but it you know if someone like if you've registered with someone like general Patton, it's because you're you're out there you're doing stuff and and, and this is this again this kind of paradox of special forces by the nature of doing things in the secret who knows what they're doing but if you if you don't if you're only doing things in secret how can you progress because no one knows what you're doing so 
it's it's a strange thing. You've got to kind of be be known to people, but not for what you actually do, but the fact that you can do it well, if that makes sense. Yeah, and it's a, it's a constant battle. Thirty, like many sort of private armies, as they were being referred to in the in sort of 41, 42, 43, they had to prove themselves to to you know keep their existence. The, they were made up of um, temporary navy officers. There was no there were no regular naval officers in it. There were regular marine officers, but some of the marines, Royal Marines, who were working in that in that unit, weren't perhaps the best. They weren't the top quality ones, um, and sometimes the discipline wasn't what it should have been. So there was a constant battle, one to to keep the unit because it because of its poor discipline record, but also, you know, it had to prove itself. And it, time and time again in North Africa, in Sicily, and then in, in Italy, and in even in the Aegean and Yugoslavia, it begins to prove itself that senior commanders go, do you know what? We've got an invasion of Europe. We're planning this. We need this unit to be at the forefront of it. Brilliant stuff. So um, we've, di we've discussed the name. Um, are we ready for point two yet? Yeah, let's, let's go. Next slide, please, Paul. So this one I've got written down as imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. So and there's Ian Fleming in the middle there. So I'll hand back to you to explain what the hell you mean by that. <laughs> yeah. So... The idea for an intelligence assault unit wasn't something that Fleming came up with out of the blue. He came up with some wacky ideas during his time in naval intelligence, but this perhaps wasn't one of them because the whole idea of this AIU was based on a very successful German unit that had been used um, in the Balkans in, Yugos in the invasion in Yugoslavia and in Greece, the, the Abwehr Commando or the Mares. Um, and their job was very much ahead of the frontline troops, um, getting in there, stealing technology, stealing code books, stealing radio equipment. Um, and this information made its way back to, to Fleming in the in, in, in naval intelligence. And he thought, this, yep, this is what we need to do, but the Admiralty needs to be in charge of this. We need it from a naval point of view. And I think part of that is because of the enigma that, that, that you know, the the need and the desire and the and the necessity to to break the enigma and to keep on top of the the enigma um, machines and messages. So he proposes the unit, and you can see it on the the left um, image there. That that is his original proposal document. Um, Fleming famously signed everything just with an F, and I'm pretty certain um, he does that simply because the head of MI6 signed everything with a C. So I think it. He just sees that if the head of MI6 can just use a letter, then so, so can I. Um, 20th of March, 1942. Um, but it's not until uh, July 1942 that combined uh, operations confirm that the unit will exist um, and put a war establishment together. Now, interestingly, I know you've been talking about sort of leaders of special forces units during, during special forces week. And one of the, the first things that, they do is they appoint um, Robert Ryder, um, who'd won his VC at St. Nazaire. They appoint him as the first CO of the unit and give him the task of, of basically creating the unit. Um, now, interestingly, obviously he'd been at St. Nazaire, but he'd also been at Dieppe. And we, uh, I'm sure Dieppe will come in because some of the men, some of the original men of 30 were at Dieppe as well. Um, so Ryder's appointed and basically the units created with an amalgamation of the Royal Navy, the Royal Marines, the Royal Air Force um, and the Army. Now, the Royal Air Force don't particularly like this idea. They think that they can do just as well on their own. They think they can rely on the RAF regiments to do what they need to do in intelligence gathering terms. The Army, again, are a little bit more difficult to persuade because they have the field security police who they think you know can do a good enough job but what pushes it i think through is the fact that this will operate ahead or alongside those frontline troops the field security police are very good at operating behind the lines once you know the areas have been captured but for this unit to be effective they've got to be there at that time or literally as the, as the enemy are going out one door you're coming in the next one um you know that's that that's how it's got to be so yeah, by the time we get to August 1942, the first sort of massizations of the unit are being put together. Um, 
And the first outing for for some of the men is in the Dieppe raid. Now, I know you've had David on talking about the Dieppe raid and... We, we've just been joking in the sidebar that, that, that once you said Enigma, David O'Keefe <laughs> is summoned from the ether. He, whatever he was doing, he's he just going to turn around. He's online now because that it's like, it's like if you say Enigma three times, David O'Keefe appears. You say Ian Fleming, he appears actually in person in your living room. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, and and again, one of the you know, David and I basically started to get in touch and started to talk through this idea that thirty, the, the early time, the early days of thirty were involved in this, you know, the the main aim, if you like, of the Dieppe raid, that pinch idea of of the the, the rotors and the, the Enigma machines from the from the and the books from the Hotel Modern in in Dieppe, and when you look at what the unit was about and you look at the Dieppe raid and you look at what what the what the needs were of the um what the needs were of the the british at that time it all starts to fall into place and you think actually yeah you know i can see why this is why this is a, a, a strong argument and it's interesting you mentioned uh, Ryder there because you know with San Nazaire and Dieppe you know under his belt there there's someone who's seen exactly how tri-service events can work well together and cannot work so well together and to drive this unit forward you're going to need to have those units balanced because it is exactly the kind of thing that all the skills all those sets will be needed to put to, to be used together to make this work yeah and i think that's right and it's interesting that the majority 99 of the navy officers who end up serving in in 30 are volunteer reserve so they're Royal Navy volunteer reserve they're not career Navy officers and I think part of that is because they didn't want to risk their careers if you like the the is you know the, the the hostility only guys didn't really have anything to lose um some of them were just given commissions because they were specialists in an area and they needed to be to have some sort of rank to to operate uh, uh, in the unit um but I, I you know, I wonder whether Ryder was was given the job because of his celebrity, because of his weight that it would carry, both you know higher up um, with, with combined ops, but also with recruiting the right men underneath him. Yeah, because I guess by forty two, there's there's some competition for the, these sorts of because there, as we we talked about before, there are these other special forces that are being established, and they're all looking essentially for the same kind of people—people people who think outside the book, adventurous types, who intelligent, uh, um, adaptable, world travelled. You know, you could go on with a list of qualities. And by forty-two, you've got commando units are plenty, airborne forces, SAS, you got the, the, the things going the desert, Popsky's army. You know, there's a lot of competition for, for those kind of characters. So Ryder's a kind of person that if you got a call from him, I guess, if you were a lieutenant in a, in a Royal Naval Reserve unit, you'd kind of, you'd, you'd notice if Ryder sought you out. Yeah. And he, he cleverly pulls in two, you know, two experienced and again, charismatic officers. So one of them, Quentin Riley, he pulls him in. He'd been a polar explorer prior to, to that. Obviously it was a requirement that they could speak languages french german um being a testy but riley had been a, a polar explorer he'd been an adventurer um he he recruited um dunstan curtis who'd been with him at saint nazaire and one of dsc um for his command one of the mtbs at saint nazaire you know so he he pulls in men who he knows he can rely on who've got experience um and again yeah charisma to to lead these if you like this ragtag body that's that's going to have to make it up as it goes along cool so essentially copied from a german idea and then streamlined by bringing in some good, good people who've got experience to, to take this idea forward is that a good summary of point two yeah i think so yeah which moves yeah. us on to the pub we're going to go to the pub now aren't we if, so um <laughs> yeah so slightly slightly more light-hearted one i suppose um 30 30 commando um SEU, Special Engineering Unit, as they were at that time. They were based initially at a little village called Amersham in Buckinghamshire, just outside London. It's about, I'd say, about 30 minutes by, by train outside of London. So it was near enough that they could communicate easily with um, the Admiralty and SOE and, and MI6 and all the rest of it. 
so they could communicate there. Um, and they were based, billet as with all special forces units, commander units, they were based, billeted in the houses around. Cole Morham, which is the house you can see in the photo, that was the main headquarters of the unit. Um, still exists today. A lovely family lived there. Um, had a, several nice conversations with them, and they they were amazed to learn of their their connection. But the men being billeted around Amersham um, meant that you know they were part of the community and so on. And just down the road from Colmoram is a is a pub that's again still there today called the Crown. It's opposite the old town hall, and the men of 30 used to frequent the crown as did the local home guard um, and exercises training alongside and against the home guard were were planned over a pint in the pub um, and then acted out on the on the field um, and I've spoken to a, a gentleman who David O'Keefe actually found for me living in Canada a gentleman by the name of Tom Tom Bonham um, he was one of the first into to the unit, um, obviously still alive today and has some lovely memories and stories of his time in, in Amersham. Um, and so, yeah, that's where that's come from, even to the extent of they when they were uh, being shipped out to North Africa um, in preparation for Operation Husky, they'd got very attached to a, a little black dog that used to follow them around Amersham. Turned up at the station as they're they're departing out of the the billets for Liverpool. Um, his dog turns up at the station, so they decide that they can't leave it and they take it with them. So much so that they they get it to Liverpool something on the train. There and one of them puts it in his rucksack, in his kit bag, gets it onto the ship, and the boat and the dog then travels all the way to Algeria with the unit. Um, sadly, Tob couldn't remember what happened to the dog when it got to Algeria. But I think it's just, it's just, you know, it sort of sums up the type of men that were involved that, you know, you'd go to the, you'd go to the lengths of smuggling a dog on board. In your, yeah. In your and, and it does, and it sum, summarizes, as we've talked about as well this week, this, the 42 era compared to the 44 era where everything becomes a lot more professional and these units tend to become more like regular british army regiments with a with a hierarchy and a structure and they expand of course so you you, you the, the 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 spread of eccentrics kind of is a bit more varied in 1944 in 42 it's all the kind of the the oddballs and we've had a request from lance for you to tell the his wounding story uh the, the veteran there <laughs> yeah so um tom um went to trained up in in amersham went out to algeria uh, took part in Operation Husky invasion of Sicily. He'd been in Sicily for about a week and was sat with some of his comrades and was hit in the shoulder by a bullet um, and was evacuated out. He was quite seriously injured, evacuated out. And sadly for Tom, that was the last time he ever had any contact with the unit at all. Um, Post-war, he moved over to Canada and so on and completely lost lost contact with anybody. When David got in touch with him, David and I had had a David O'Keefe and I had had a chat beforehand, and I'd found out a little bit of information about Tom that he'd actually been shot by one of his comrades who'd been cleaning his his weapon at the time. Um, so seventy odd years after it had happened, Tom, who'd always believed that he'd been shot by a German sniper, was informed that actually it was one of his comrades cleaning a weapon that had uh, incapacitated him out of the out of the unit. Um, Bless him. He took it. He took it in the, the the greatest of spirits. But it must it must have been quite a shock to suddenly realise that it was it was a friendly fire incident. Um, One of those things that have taken a bit of a while to process. I think yeah. seventy years on, you know. Yeah. So so that's how it was. But yeah, yeah. So so number three, pub planned exercises, which takes I think number four to um, desert sailors is number four. Yeah. So um, I think when we those people who know about thirty AU or have heard of thirty AU. It's all about what they were doing in France and Germany post, you know, D-Day and post D-Day. But the unit, as we've seen, was existed from sort of mid-1942. And well, some of its great successes and where it really learns how to operate and where it really 
puts its tactics into practice and develops the tactics that it's going to later use successfully in Europe is in the deserts of North Africa. So the group you can see in the photo there, um, those are some of the originals that were in the unit. All of those had been at the Dieppe uh, raid um, alongside uh, Captain Huntington Whiteley, who, who'd led um, the platoon. All of them had been there. And that's a photo taken on their way back, having taken part in Operation Torch. And we were uh, trying to uh, take Algiers alongside the Americans. Um, didn't work out as successfully as, as it had hoped. The, the, the French resistance um, was, was a lot sterner than, than the Allies had hoped for. But in January 43, Curtis, who we've mentioned, um, and Huntington Whiteley returned to, to Africa um, to take, you know, to, to operate in the, alongside the frontline troops to gather the, the intelligence as it's obvious that the Axis forces are beginning to, to collapse and they're being driven back into, into Tunisia. So they um, arrive in, in Algiers. They've got three jeeps, all of them named after Royal Marine bases. So you had the uh, one named after Deal, one named after Chatham, one named after Plymouth, and then you had the, the Pompey privateer um, named after, after Portsmouth. Three jeeps and, what, and two motorcycles was all they had between sort of what 15 16 of them and they work out what they're going to do they do a bit of training get used to the to the desert and then curtis decides that the eighth army are going to be the ones that are going to make the move first of all first army is a little bit stagnant in, in the west so news comes through that eighth army are beginning a, a push and Curtis decides, right, we've got to be over with 8th Army rather than 1st Army. So the three Jeeps, the two motorcycles decide that they're going to drive south, um, basically following the, the front line between the Americans and the Germans, uh, hit the, the Salt Lake, and then basically turn east and, and link up with 8th Army. Now, I'm sure some people will will maybe argue the point, but... They are probably the first Allied unit to link up from First Army to the Eighth Army at this point, and they come flying out of the the Western Desert, bump into the to the New Zealand Division, um, who don't even bat an eyelid about the fact that suddenly a bunch of Royal Marines and Royal Navy officers in white topped caps have suddenly come out of the desert um, and simply just point them in the direction of the of the Fifty First Division and, and move them across. A little bit um but you know they made <laughs> they must have made quite an interesting sight flying through the desert as i say there were battle dress green berets white top naval caps um and a huge white ensign flying from the front jeep which uh which apparently caused some issues for the driver if the wind was blowing in the wrong wrong direction um but yeah so they they learn the the trade if you like in in tunisia so they work alongside the, the 51st Division for a lot of it. Um, for some of the um, attacks, particularly on Suffolk, they actually end up riding on the back of the tanks. Um, so that that's how close they needed to be with the, with the assault troops. They needed to be right in there because if they were to do their job properly, they couldn't give the enemy time to destroy anything. Um, they pretty successful in um, grabbing some some um, Italian um, signals intelligence, um, code books, charts, uh, radar frequencies, etc. Um, but the issue was is that the the Germans and the Italians had known for a long time that an assault was going to come, that, a, that a, the final push was going to come. They knew for a long time that the end was was near, so they had a lot of time to to get rid of much of the you know the, the if you like the high prized items um but at the end of it 30 commando proves that this is a useful unit that they can achieve what they've set out to do that they can add to the intelligence knowledge that's being developed that they can add technological information um signals intelligence information so much so that when they re return 
um, to the UK after after this, they're then, you know, assigned as part of Operation Husky. So they're seen as being, you know, they, they're proving that they're worth, they're proving their point and and are on to the next to the next one. Which is a great time to ask you Dave's question there is about what command gave the, gave, level gave them their assignments, because we're talking about Operation Biting on Saturday, which was a, a, a special forces mission where the objective couldn't be clearer. Here's a radar. Go get information about that radar. Here's exactly where it is. Now, the, from what I understand of 30, is it's much more of a loose find us stuff that will help. I mean, it's a very broad kind of instruction. So who who gives them the, I mean, obviously they're into theater by a high level, but who on the ground decides where they're going to look? So w- one of the reasons they were successful is I think the, if you like the research that went into before they went into theater and NID, Naval Intelligence Division, the Admiralty, kept very tight control of the, of the unit, even though it came under the, the command of combined operations. And basically what they did is they sent out this message to all the, the parts of the Navy and to the Army and said, right, what do you want us to find? What would be useful? A shopping um, list, essentially. Yeah. shopping list, basically. And, th- and that's exactly what the 30 had. They then had this, this shopping list of things. If we can find it, then we, you know, that's good. Then we can bring it back. It gets much more formalized as we as we've discussed, you know, as we get in preparations for D-Day, it's much more formalized and they start to produce what was known as black books, which were, you know, very thick, very detailed um, information, shopping lists of what you were looking for. And that included, you know, locations, it included names, it included, you know, what you might find there. But part of the training for the for the men of, of 30 was how to identify important intelligence and how to identify what documents might be important you know so that, that was all part of their training because yes you bought a shopping list but there's always going to be something that you you know as you're wandering around the supermarket you think oh i quite like the look of that that might be handy or that might be tasty and that's what they had to be able be able to do um there's a famous there's a story uh, when they're in um when they're entering into germany and there's one of the the navy officers thinks he's found something that's going to shorten the course of the war that's going to change the course of the war um it's this you know fantastic machine it's quickly thrown into the back of a truck it's whisked back to shape it's whisked back to the admiralty turns out it's just a telephone exchange right <laughs> yeah, nothing more but it mu- it just must have looked slightly different slightly quirky um so most of the time they got it right but but you know it, it in all of that you're going to get some things wrong and that that's you know i mean we could go down numerous rabbit holes but you know tell a few powers to go and blow up that thing over there it's a it's a fairly clear cut mission that will either succeed or fail you know we can imagine that the german army or the german kriegsmarine whatever would would function on an enormous enormous amount of paperwork enormous amount of yeah. just bump that fills up a headquarters because that's how they organize themselves so you're rushing in you know as you say that the, the germans will be will be trying to destroy stuff before they retreat and you're in there and the time is on you know it's the clock is ticking and you've got about to uh, assess quite quickly what's what's worth taking back because you can't put every single filing cabinet you find on the back of a jeep and drive it back to headquarters no and the other issue obviously was that a lot of these places were booby trapped so yeah. if the germans didn't have time to do, to destroy it they at least had time to to booby trap it so you've you've got that time constraint of trying to find things quickly because you need to be moving on to the next target but safely. but also safely because you don't know you know what's gonna what's gonna go off in your hand wow brilliant stuff we'll, we'll keep on moving if you don't mind so um, yeah, no, no. um yeah what well, are we up to next point now the AG. Um, so again so we, we jump to the next one i think because i think that's tom and uh and that's tom and Natalia. we should have done that one before shouldn't we yeah, but yeah so um right. the next so number five the official point is the Aegean, a sad and regrettable chapter yeah so um 30 command 30 commander was made up of royal navy royal marines and what was known as 34 troop which was the which was the army side of things um paul i think if we just jump to the next slide i think i might have added that's it yeah um and the the gentleman in the photograph there is lieutenant um 
Tom Belcher of the South Staffs Regiment. He um, became part of 30 Commando towards uh, the middle of, of uh, 40, 43. Um, trains in Amersham. And him and a group of uh, army other ranks were sent out to the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, again, to hunt down intelligence, but also to sort of fulfill 30's other role, which was as, if you like, observations to observe, recon, pass back in intelligence on German movements and so on. Um, and they're sent out to, to the Aegean and in um, September 1943, they find themselves um, around the islands of Leros and, and Naxos and Kalaminos. And again, there isn't a huge amount for them to do. They're being shipped around from island to island by, um, again, some of the sort of you know private navies that were operating at that point in, in the Aegean. They're working alongside the LRDG that are out there and, and elements of the, of the SAS. But the Germans are still hugely active at that point in the in the Aegean. And on the, the 4th of October, uh, the Germans have taken the island of Kos and the small detachment of 30 are forced back to um, forced back on to um, Leros. And on the morning of the, of the uh, 5th of October, as they're brewing up their tea on the dockside, uh, a, a file of Stukas come down and Tom Belcher and three others are, are killed in the raid. Um, now, the issue with all of this was that they never really achieved anything. They didn't gain any real intelligence. They didn't have any real purpose to be out there. Um, and it just feels like a real waste. It's one of those operations where you look at it and you go, that really was just a waste of life. They they didn't need to be there. They didn't achieve anything. They didn't have clear direction and they lost their lives out there. Um, it, uh, Glanville, who wrote the, the official history at the end of the war, describes it as a sad and regrettable chapter in the history of the unit. Um, now, Tom Belcher obviously um, lost his life. There is buried on the island. But I've been really fortunate enough to to make contact and get to know his daughter, who's been amazing um, in letting me read the the letters from her father to her mother, um, and has also donated a, a huge amount of, of things that she, she kept from her father, including some of his uniforms, um, to to a sort of mini archive that I'm trying to to create for 30 i haven't found a, a museum home for it yet but it's it, it's being created but you know it's you get to to read those letters you get to see what the man was like and when you read those letters when he's out in the aegean there's nothing amazing in it there's no mind you know there's no story changing details or anything but it just shows you what he was going through and then when you see the pointless loss of life at the end of it you just think why yeah it's a good point dave because it, you know we can at, we as historians and david o'keefe watching and others watching we can analyze the effectiveness of a unit and say okay this was where the unit did function better and this this area here perhaps they weren't they, they weren't suited for it and this is it got better again but all along the way are human beings human beings who are who are I don't want to use the word victims, but they are the they are the pawns in this in this improvement of the technology, and and sometimes along the way they die as as part of the learning curve of how to use a unit that is a special unit. People are are victims of that progression. Yeah, um, and I think you know you you look at how the unit was being how the navy and the marine side of the unit was being used, and it was much more successful. But they weren't replicating it at at, at this point, and it was you know it was a, a real sort of of wasting it, I suppose. Hmm. Yeah. Well, um, and, and, and thanks for the the fact you're sharing the interest in the in the family side of it, because it, you know these discussions can, as I say, be about the the effectiveness of the unit, and it's 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 a people story ultimately. So, um, yeah, great information. And we'll move on to um, number six, one man, three admirals. I think that's the right photo. 
It is. That's yeah, perfect. Um, so that's they, that gentleman is um, Trevor James Glanville, um, and yeah, this section is titled "One Man and Three Admirals." Thirty is full of rather eccentric um, men, particularly um, the officers amongst them, um, and we'll come across some more of them later on. But this this is the one that I think sort of slips under the radar a bit in people's knowledge, um, but. He's a fascinating, fascinating story. So he's born in Rhodesia. He ends up working uh, as a chartered accountant in Zagreb um, and basically become is working as British vice consul. But all of that is a cover story for him working for the intelligence services. Um, and when the, the, the Italians and the Germans invade, um, he is uh, arrested because he's trying to um, negotiate with the Yugoslav Secret Service. He's arrested by the Croats, handed over to the Italians, um, makes his way back to London through a prisoner exchange, and then ends up working for, for SOE. He spends a short time working for SOE in Lisbon, comes back... Um, in to London in, in October 41. By this point, he's been commissioned as a lieutenant in the army. His, his SOE code name was Nero. But to give him a little bit of clout, if you like, they'd given him a commission. But then he's called upon to be used by 30 commando. So he's then commissioned in the Royal Navy. Um, he's given no formal naval training. Um, any sort of naval etiquette has to be learned on the job. Um, you know, learn to when you can wear your cap, when you can't wear your cap, etc. Um, and his first operation alongside 30 is Operation Husky in Sicily. And then effectively, he's with the unit right the way through through Italy, um, Yugoslavia, which we'll come back to in a moment, through into Northwest Europe, um, and eventually finds his way serving in the Far East at the end of the war with the unit. Now, one of his achievements and one of the reasons for the title One Man, Three Admirals is he's got a fairly unique, I think, achievement of actually capturing three admirals, one from each of the Axis forces. So um, during the operations off the coast of Italy, he is tasked with uh, raiding one of the islands and capturing an admiral, um, Messini, who was the Italian torpedo expert. Um, the admiral's the admiral's wife um, was was asked to to go and pack. Um, the admiral would only come along if he could be declared a prisoner of war, even though Italy had at this point um, surrendered. So the admiral's wife packs bags, throws onto the to the boat, um, and so on. Then in uh, April 1945. Uh, Glanville's leading a, a small team. He's leading his team through through Germany, hunting down various intelligence. And they find a letter which talks about a stash of documents uh, at the Slosh Tambak. Um, and there are various Tambaks in the area, but they eventually pinpoint down which one it is. When they arrive there, they find three German admirals, um, lots of female Kriegsmarine staff, um, and the entire German naval archive from 1875, which apparently Dönitz has, had ordered that it be kept and be stored to prove that the Kriegsmarine had not been complicit in any of the Nazi atrocities. And that mm. they had, so, you know, Dönitz was looking past the, the, the surrender, past the final outcome, um, and was hoping to use these. So, yeah, Glanville captures three German admirals at that point. And then, as I say, at the end of the war, um, in July 45, he's he's posted out to Southeast Asia to uh, to take part in the planned invasions of, of Malaya, again, operating as, a, as a, an intelligence assault unit. So 30 AU were planned to be part of the landings at Penang. Um, he wanted to focus in on, on Singapore because that was the main naval target that they saw in the area. But ended up getting posted to Indochina, hunting down um, Japanese intelligence and um, 
famously arrested a Japanese admiral as part of that and sort of did his hat trick at that point. That's insane. Then, yeah. Uh, he was, uh, yeah. Um, and, I, you know, a really, a real character in the group. Post-war, he goes on, not only does he go on to write the official history for the Admiralty, but later he goes on to assist with um, David Nutting's book, which was attained by surprise, which basically was lots of recollections of the of the man who'd served in 30, and he was part of that. He was a driving force in the in the 30 Association. Um, you know, he was really a real popular figure, the figure with his men. <laughs> Interesting, some of the ways he was dis described. So um, Dunstan Curtis, who was his superior for, for most of the war, um, described, says about him that alongside all his virtues, he packed a pig-headed and arrogant certainty of his own righteousness, <laughs> which, I, which, I, which I guess is exactly what you want from special forces. <laughs> you know, always believing that you are perfectly right all the time um yeah, it's a, it's a, that's that's insight into the kind of people that, that 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 prosper in this sort of environment absolutely yeah yeah um and uh jeffrey pike uh, one of the royal marine captains he he said he was an extraordinary man um he never seemed frightened just interested in whatever was going on um and one of the marines who landed on uh juno beach with him distinctly remembers uh, Glanville arriving on the beach, carrying a walking stick, standing bolt upright, and commenting on the butterflies that, that he could see as the bullets and the bombs were, were flying around him. Um, you know, just, just just one of those characters, one of those eccentrics who who was always going to find his way into into some sort of special forces. Wow! Um, but it, what a legend! Yeah, just going back to. Obviously, he started his career um, with SOE in, in Yugoslavia, and after uh, Italy had surrendered, 30 were then targeted to move to Yugoslavia to support the partisans and to find, you know, what was available, what targets were available on the on the Adriatic coast. So Glanville, because he'd been, he'd worked over there, he was obviously chosen to, to lead that expedition. Um, sadly, what 30 and its bosses didn't realize was that SOE had this clearly written in Glanville's SOE file do not send this man back to Yugoslavia because he will he will cause you too many problems um and he, he does because he, he arrives in in Yugoslavia um Tito um Marshal Tito has, has taken an instant dislike to whatever he'd done in the past and in no uncertain terms he's told to leave the country immediately um, and 30s involvement in Yugoslavia comes to a very rapid, very rapid end at that point. Well, we could do an entire show about SOE 30 and and, and the, the relationships with various factions in Yugoslavia because it it it's a Gordian knot of complications the British and American relationships with what was going on in that country. And uh, yeah, I, I want to go back in and investigate Yugoslavia World War Two, but it's an it's a minefield, no pun intended, of just com intrigue and factions and changing allegiances, and but very, very interesting. But talking of traveling around the world, that brings us up to our next point, number yeah. seven, worldwide warriors, because your, your point you're going to make is kind of no unit had as many men from the same kind of the same men on as many different theaters as, as this as this unit. Yeah, so it, it occurred to me. It's, only really while I was putting this together for, for tonight, it, it occurred to me that one of the things I think is special about 30 is that it operated as as the same unit, as the, often as the same group of men. It operated in almost every theatre of operations that the Allies were working in. So it begins in North Africa, it moves to Sicily, it moves to Italy, it operates in the Balkans, it operates in the Aegean, and it goes to Northwest Europe, and then eventually it goes out to the Far East, operating in um, Malaya um, and and then in Indochina. Now, I'm sure in your vast audience out there, someone's going to point point out that it's, it's not the only unit. But I would pretty I would I think there's a pretty strong argument to, to say, you know, in the criteria of a unit with the same officers, the same men in the same format, there can't be many um, that serve the cops sort of i think is probably one of the ones that might be along the same sort of line 
but again they were different elements of the same yeah. unit I, um, I would suggest that darren little who's watching a member of his family was in every theater in world war ii i don't think i've done a single show where darren hasn't chirped in with <laughs> my grandfather was there or my it, that the little family along with 30 au i think influenced <laughs> the outcome of world war ii more than any other family in in the uk and if, if darren's watching i hope he's kind of smirking at that but it's it's insane i mean he's famously with commandos out in burma but yeah i mean they had an extraordinary, extraordinary worldwide influence, and uh, that's a good point to make. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah. Next, next one, Paul. Um, so, this is a bit about um, a bit more about where the men came from, because I think you know a lot of it is these were ordinary men, as with most units in the war of most special forces. These were just ordinary men who had quite mundane, perhaps day jobs before before the war but they end up doing extraordinary things or they're involved in extraordinary things. Um, and, you know, we look back on them and when we look at the individual men, we think, wow, that, that is something special. So um, one of the most fascinating documents I found was uh, from the early days of the unit. I listed all of the Marines who were in the unit at that time and what their previous occupations had been before they joined the unit and there was everything from policemen through to uh, farmers steam and uh, there was an engineer in there and um, so all, a real mix but what we find and i think this is partly because of the the type of men that were needed is that several of the the marines who end up in the unit were were former policemen they were coppers because they you know they had that if you like that that knows for intelligence, that knows for finding things, um, that that ability to work. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They, you know, they already had that ingrained. So that gentleman there is, is Bert Morgan. He was a policeman in Wallasey, just near, uh, just on the other side of the river from from Liverpool, um, and joined the unit in 1943. Obviously, he didn't have to. He was in a protected job being a policeman, but. Um, signs up to do his bit in 1943 and works in Sicily and in D-Day, um, is involved in the, the searches in, in Paris when the, when the unit gets into Paris, um, searching through all the things in there. Um, and Colonel Woolley, who, who was the, the head of the unit at the time, the, the officer commanding, says this about him. He says, of all the RM personnel, I wish to particularly mention the name of Marine Morgan, who regularly worked long hours and went far beyond the normal requirements of his duty, both in searching for documents and sorting, listing, packing and labelling of captured material. He was personally responsible for finding in unusual places several valuable documents. So, you know, his ex, his previous copper skills obviously came into, into their own um, and he seemed to have had a real nose for, for finding that you know, the important information, despite the fact that it probably tried to be hidden or burned or destroyed yeah. in whatever way. But um, your point is entitled Cops and Robbers. So we've done the cops. We, we yeah, ought to move so, on to the robbers. Yeah, so let's jump to the next gentleman. So some people may may recognise this guy. Um, and he's got a fascinating story. This is um, Johnny Romensky. He was Scottish. Um, and prior to the to the war, prior to his involvement with 30 Commando, he basically was a professional cat burglar and an expert safe cracker. He'd been in and out of jails in in Scotland for several years. He was a little bit of a folk hero. He was a little bit of a sort of Robin Hood type, I think, even though I don't think he ever gave anything back to the poor, but he was from a poor background. He was sort of anti-establishment, so he was... Seen as a bit of a working class, class hero. Um, January 1943, he's up again in front of a judge once more. And the judge says to him, look, I'm either going to send you to prison for an awfully long time this time, or you can join up and you can, you know, we can make use of your skills um, against the, against the Germans. So gentleman Johnny, as he was known, goes, yeah, okay, fine. So he's um, recruited into the Royal Fusiliers never actually serves with them, even though you can see there he's wearing a, a Fusiliers badge on his barry, never serves with them. Um, his 
job basically was working in 30, blowing safes, you know, getting into any German Italian safe that they could find um, and finding out what was in there. Um, he famously blew 14 safes in a day when 34 troop got into Rome um, in, in June 1944. He blew 14 safes. He was awarded the military medal for his services, um, but sadly returned to a life of crime after he was demobbed in 1946. Now, there are all sorts of legends about, about Johnny and what he may have acquired during his time as opening those safes, because obviously he would have been the first one to see what was inside them. <laughs> no, there was no gold, Governor. No, there was no gold in there. In there. No, no, no. no. Um, <laughs> Money? Diamonds? No. <laughs> But actually, but actually, that's true for a, for a lot. When you talk to the vets or you listen to their stories, um, you know, there was a lot of the, particularly the officers, came back pretty wealthy men. Um, and the rumour always, you know, in, in anything like that, the rumour is, well, yeah, you know, they did quite well out of the war for themselves. How true it is, you don't wow. know. Maybe it's just a soldier's tale. Wow. Um, it's it's intri an intriguing possibility. And, and it... And it it raises that serious point that we've discussed in Special Forces Week and previously is that what type of men do you need for a special force? And it depends on what the purpose of the special force is. And in this case, you know, as you say cops and robbers, it's ideal. You know, this guy's yeah. going to be able to know how to approach buildings, uh, entry points, uh, you know, getting in quickly, uh, and then the cop for determining the, the the results. It's it's a perfect blend. And then you have all the experts, the people with the languages, the people who understand torpedo technology or or communications. And, you know, of all the special forces, and I'm not saying just saying it's because you're here today, it is the one that probably is the most, that the men are m the most fit for the specific purpose of the, of, of the unit. Yeah, and that's right. And, you know, if they needed a, an expert in torpedoes or they, they knew that a, a specific target contain mine technology or whatever then you know that technician that specialist was brought into the unit for that particular um you know for that particular mission or that particular phase of the operation so there was certainly in the naval officers that there could be quite a turnover of of specialists um but there was that one core but you're right they needed so many different skills because their job as you, it wasn't like you know, being in the powers or being in the SAS, you weren't just there to go in, blow something up and get out. You weren't just muscle and brawn and, and right. weapons ability, which I mean, and that's no, I'm not, we're not saying anything negative about the parachute. Regiment no, 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 not, but we're just saying that that is a very specific job. You're physically fit and you can go and blow things up and kill the enemy. But this is a, a much more, what it's a, it's a narrow focus mission, but it involves a wider range of skills. Yeah. 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 Which brings us to talking about, about specific uses. It brings us to D-Day, my neck of the woods, Operation Neptune, Normandy, yeah. and and, yeah. and your point here is, uh, this is this is point number number nine. Um, D-Day, three out of five, which I know what that means. Um, but let I'll let you explain the, the background. Yeah. So January nineteen forty four, or December forty three, the units recall back to Britain, um, and it's detailed to be part of. Operation Neptune, and you can see it clearly on the on the, the organisational chart. The um, it, it proved its worth. Um, it was reorganised. It was strengthened in numbers. It was re-equipped. Um, it's it's finally given you know armoured cars. It's given in, enough trucks. It's it, it's war establishment is increased. Um, it's moved to Littlehampton on the south coast um, for its final training base. And there's a there's there's a a range of training that's taken, undertaken by the men in um, parachuting uh, up at Ringway Airport, um, by the Army Film Unit in how to photograph documents and so on. They undergo, um, you know, urban warfare training in the in the, the in the, the ruins of Battersea in South London. Um, all of that goes into their training, because, again, I think, you know, few units have. Uh, can claim this, but um, 30 AU, a small unit, ends up landing on three out of the five yeah. beaches. Um, and and I think that is a testament to to how the, the, the you know the higher authorities looked upon the unit and, and saw its value because it needed to be inserted in those that many locations to be of to be of use. Um, 
So first, um, first landing is on D-Day itself, um, eight hour plus 20 uh, on Juno alongside the, the North Shore Regiment. Um, and they land, uh, I say on Juno, the, their first target is, and I'm going to apologize for my pronunciation, Paul, so you can laugh at me or pull me up on it, but it's uh, Douvre de la Diverand. Douvre de la Diverand, yes. There yeah, we yeah. Go. yeah. Um, which is thought to be um, a high quality radar target. Um, once again, their intelligence is poor. And when the, the Canadians and the commandos and, and 30 AU reach it, they find that it's a much more heavily defended and heavily fortified position than anybody had, had realized previously. Um, and it becomes obvious that they're not going to be able to take that that night. So they're not going to be able to achieve their, their day one objective there. Um, Kurt Force. Um, so it's, the unit was split into to three forces, if you like. Uh, Juno Beach was Pike Force. Kurt Force landed on D-Day plus one on Sword. Um, and they had quite a quiet landing, obviously. They camped at Crepon um, overnight. Um Along what you find throughout this is that the uh, the Marines are very good at um, making their vehicles have a bit of a personality. So some of the some of Kurt Force's vehicles were were named Grumpy, Vicky, and Miscarriage. Now, now interestingly, Miscarriage apparently breaks down three times on the first day, so it was, it was obviously very aptly named that one. And interesting um, that, that you say there they land on Saw, but they end up at Crepon because Crepon, uh, Crepon is inland from Gold Beach. So rather like their link up between First and uh, and um, Eighth Armies in North Africa, they're they're crossing they're crossing frontiers yeah. essentially, um, yeah. which explains again their kind of unique role in that they're the are the, the the beach landing team forces are, are have um, objectives inland, but but in this case they're kind of going left, right, and center based on intelligence needs. That's it. And as we said earlier, you know, they've got these black books, these shopping lists yeah. of things with them. They're operating in small teams. They'd already proven the value of having a, a couple of RN officers, Royal Marine officer, and a group of Marines operating in 30 AU is probably the most mobile unit of any allied unit for the number of men that were involved, you know, so they're, they're tearing around the countryside in these jeeps um they've got a few sort of armored cars for heavy protection um but speed is vital they've got to be getting to these points and often they were yeah as you say they were you know at crossing ground that probably no other allied units were were in yeah. the vicinity of um, absolutely and uh, and that's a still from one of the uh, um the, the the films of them moving about in that area there and um you know it's it's just fascinating to think of these these teams of specialists starting about and it, it also shows you know we've talked a lot about operation overlord neptune uh, of course on world war ii tv is that every element of that invasion has been included everything an allied army might need has been provided for within the context of Operation Overlord. Every aspect doesn't always work perfectly necessarily, but everything, because of two years of planning, it, everything has been covered. And, and this is an aspect, intelligence gathering has been included in that plan. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, and so finally we get to the to the third of the three forces, and this was Wolf Force. They were due to land on D plus two but the, the transport was sunk on its way back from um, the initial landing. So that, um, that their landing was, was delayed and they eventually landed on D, D plus four. Um, and that's a photograph taken um, near Verville um, shortly after they've, they've landed. Um, now, the sad thing about wall force is that it's the only part of the, the unit to, to suffer casualties um, at this point. And the, the, on the very first night that they're in in country in Normandy, they uh, camp in the field. And I know, Paul, you've you've been to this field, haven't you? You've yeah. done some research yeah, yeah. on this. Um, and they camp in this in the field. Are feeling fairly comfortable with everything. Not many men are digging digging in at all. Um, they're just sort of crouching down. Some of them are are taking a little bit of cover under the hedgerows, trying to get a little bit of cover. But around 20 past 11, 
um, there's the sound of a, an air raid um, and these um, there's this whistling and then these little bangs and the, the Germans were basically um, apparently dropping the, the butterfly bombs that you can see hanging th there as anti-personnel um, bombs. Wolf Force end up with five dead and 16 wounded, which is the largest casualty rate at any point during the, the war for the unit. For such a small unit, it suffered very lightly on casualties in the rest of the the war. So this had a real impact. You know, to lose this many in one in one go was a real shock um, to the unit. And and one, and I think this was the one you were involved in, Paul, was um, um, Ionides, Lieutenant yeah. Ionides. Um, you know, he's young, young naval officer, hostilities only. It was his first operation with the unit. He'd not been in the unit very long, um, and sadly, you know, killed on his first day, as many were, but killed on his yeah. first day, day in Normandy. And, and just for the background, folks, uh, Justin Marriott, who is a BBC re uh, reporter correspondent, I think he's in, in in ecology now. I think he reports on green issues. I saw him up in the a Antarctic or something recently. Justin's grandfather was Ionides, and he was re re retracing his grandfather's steps for the one show for the BBC. This is about, it might, might be 10 years ago now, quite yeah. a long time ago. So, you know, I was the on-ground guy, and we took we took Justin to the field where his grandfather was 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 killed. And then in the studio, um, Justin's mother, so the, the, the daughter, was was in the studio talking about the loss of her father. And, and, he's, and he's buried. Ionides is buried. 500 yards away from my house every pretty much every time i go to the cemetery in bayer he's the grave i go and see because i just know a little bit about the story and it's you know it's, it's one of those graves there that you know if you looked him up you'd say what on earth is a royal naval reserve volunteer reserve officer being doing being killed for three miles in land from american landing beach it doesn't seem yeah. to naturally make any sense but it when you understand the unit history it makes complete sense yeah yeah so well, we're, we're, we're rapidly moving on. So um, I think number the next point we've got a few more to go now. Number this is number ten, and we've got thirteen actually. We're giving you a baker's dozen uh, of, of <laughs> ten. Right. Points I, yeah, I, as a as a previous PE teacher in a in a previous existence, I can't count, so I've gone to thirteen. So that's yeah. um, Lieutenant Ionides and his and his daughter actually, who we've just been yeah. speaking about. Um, if we jump to the next one, I think um, the next topic is. Um, Wavy Navy bootnecks and flyboys, I think I've termed. termed which, which sound, when you sent me that, that sounds like an album by um, the men they couldn't hang. That sounds like a folk <laughs> punk album that I would have bought in 1987. Wavy <laughs> Navy bootnecks and flyboys. That's, I'm sure I saw that live set. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, one of the, I think for me, one of the fascinating things about the unit and one of the things that really sort of hooked me into it initially was the, just the variety of different units and different men that that came under this this banner of 30 au and um i started up a living history group for for 38 au simply because there were so many different things that you could portray and let's just say that 30 perhaps weren't as strict at keeping to regulations and uniform restrictions and so on um that it gave us a you know a whole lot of things we could play around with just to really play with people's minds and blow you know the experts that come up to you and say well that's the wrong cap badge or that's the wrong button that you're wearing well, actually no it's not because and all the rest of it but we've already talked about the fact that there was navy and royal marines the navy were the were the brains of the operation they were the technical guys the marines by their own admission were the muscle of it they were there to to do the do the dogged work they were to do the the lifting the humping the shooting the killing the you know all of that the protection of the officers the raf um did have a role to play so david nutting uh, was alongside the unit because one of the things one of the most important things that they were hunting in in june 1944 was the the, the v1 sites you know part of operation cross but they were they were hunting down the the v1s they were looking for these v1 sites gathering intelligence gathering technology um so the raf were involved involved in that we've talked about the army troop the military side of it in, in 34 troop but in the photograph there it sort of summarizes what happened to the unit as it moved through france and germany because to the left you've got a royal navy officer um to his right in the center you've got a french naval officer then to the right of him you've got a royal navy rating 
then you've got a uh, a rating from the French Navy, and finally on the right hand side there, you've got a boot neck, a Royal Marine. So that photo to me just summarizes, just really sums up what the unit was and how much of a mix and amalgamation it was. But it all worked, you know, and it all worked successfully. Um, the one photo I've not found of yet is there were several US Navy officers were attached uh, to the unit. Uh, a, a Lieutenant Lambie was one of the one of the famous ones within the unit, you know, but they worked really closely alongside um, the, the Royal Navy guys and the Marines. So it was, it, yeah, it's this real mix of everything thrown in. Yeah, and you know the fact they have all these uniform varieties and, and eccentricities is 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 just fascinating. And you know, and you can imagine in the field it would have had a a weirdly odd command structure. But I mean, obviously they there was a command, there was a rank, there was a command structure. But it, you know, I mean, just the, the the referring to names because you know there's a rating next to a private, next to a trooper, next to you know, so it, it would have been really fascinating. So I suppose there would have been lots of a kind of a a freedom of expression, I suppose, within that unit. Otherwise, it'd have been everybody calling everybody different titles, all the names. So they just kind of worked as a as a band of friends, almost, I suppose. Yeah, and I think because they were operating in small teams, and you know, very much like probably the SAS teams, you know, it's first name basis a lot of it. Yeah. And what you find post war, looking through the the letters and the, the magazines and talking to people post war, that created a real esprit de corps between you know, rank didn't matter. Mm. Um, there was a real genuine affection for everybody at every level through through that unit, and that, and, and that this is probably why that, you know that was so. You're you're in for your skill first, rank second. Whereas some yeah. units, it's the other way around, isn't it? You know, you're there for your expect expertise within a particular field. But um, I feel the next point is the one that could disappear down a deep <laughs> dark rabbit hole because David is still what David O'Keefe is still watching. But this is the the general role of Signin and Enigma. So. We'll keep it brief, otherwise David O'Keefe will just jump in with a million and one points. We love David O'Keefe, but you know, but th yeah. you know, this brings it back to kind of the purpose of what it was all about. Sig Int, uh, Signals Intelligence. Um, so, what what was the point you wanted to make here, without, yeah, so without think... letting David O'Keefe kind of <laughs> take over? <laughs> yeah, keep him keep him muted up. Um, so basically, I think one of the things I wanted to point out here was probably the the changing aim of the unit if you want like the changing shopping list so 1942 the, the priority is SIGINT Enigma the, particularly the four the four rotor Enigma that had just been introduced you know that is the priority and certainly Dieppe Algiers um, and into Tunisia that's what they're after that, that's what that's their main priority they do actually capture um one in Algiers from the Italian Armistice Commission. Um, so they do actually capture a machine and some of the some of the books there and, and get it back. Um, so that you know they were successful in that. But what you find um, as it goes as it goes through, yes, it's about technology. So new designs of torpedoes, mines, radar frequencies, radar equipment, all of that. And you know, targeting the best that the Italians, are, what, they're, what they're good at, the best at what the Germans are good at, and trying to grab all that together. When we get to 1945, and there's the, the obvious collapse of Germany, there is a real shift because what's important then is what can we get that will benefit us post-war? Hmm. What are we going to be able to get hold of that will give us an advantage over what's becoming obvious that will be our next, even in a Cold War, you know, ad adversary, i.e. the Soviets. W so weirdly the topical today. It's I know, so, so I know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and 30 are at the very sort of spearhead of all of all of that. And you see that really coming to, to its head in May 1945, when it's obvious that the Germans uh, have had enough, Berlin has fallen, you know they're looking to to sign the surrenders in in, in northwestern G Germany, and there is still technologies and there are still scientists that the Allies want to get their hands on. Um, and you know this is where, as I say, thirty really come into their to their own. They on almost the last day of the war, they they 
desperate to get into to Kiel. Now Kiel was part was going to be in the the, the Soviet run area. Um, the British had orders not to advance into to Kiel, but the thirty go flying in there um, to you know to, to grab whatever they can from the from the technology and the the, the works in there. Um, the the gentleman in the white shirt at the bottom um, is Helmut Walther. Um, he was one of the Germany's top rocket and jet propulsion um, scientists. Had worked with a lot of um, technology for torpedoes and submarines, new propulsion systems for submarines, um, and all of this was obviously highly prized. He is um, actually found in his office in his in his factory by 30 AU. Um, initially refuses to cooperate until he's shown the order by Dönitz, which is, which ordered everything to be handed over to the British, and then quite happily goes and shows them where they've hidden all the documents in a in a barn um, a few miles away, you know, all the important things. Uh, technology, bits of equipment had been buried in, in ponds or in ditches in the countryside, so they go around digging up these ditches, um, you know, and all of that. But the fascinating thing for me about some of this is that the Germans right up until the end of the war were still working on developing top of the range technology, you know, brand new technologies. Mm. And that continues right the way through till, till sort of May 45. And I, I just find that fascinating sometimes. I guess they, they still thought they could pull the proverbial rabbit out of the hat with some yeah. bit of kit that would bring an end to the war, you know, which we, we know with hindsight wasn't going to happen, but that they still have that op ridiculously optimistic belief that they can still somehow come out of things alive. And it, it begs the question also is because obviously the, the unit as an assault unit has to end because the war is over, but did some of the personnel move into more peacetime, but actually moving into cold war intelligence work, but without running around in Jeeps kind of, kind of activity. Yeah. So, so what happens is um, obviously once we get through May 45, we get to June, July 45 and the Marine element of the, the the unit there's no fighting to do anymore yeah, so they fall um, away yeah yeah so they, they they're basically disbanded they're sent back to the uk um a lot of the the naval side the, the technical side of it remained there um and you know because there was a a mountain of technology and files and information to go through and they did uh Ralph Izzard who worked for the for the forward intelligence unit he travels to berlin to go through some of the information you know, so they were still traveling around and they were they were in and out of the Soviet sector. Um, and it's only anecdotal, but I'm pretty certain that there were probably some very close run ins with with some Soviets you know, in, in this last grasp attempt to sort of grab personnel and, and equipment and so on. Um, wow. Interestingly, probably one of the most controversial claims for thirties, the two gentlemen in the in the, the photo in the middle, they're the von Braun brothers, who were very famously um, found, you know, by the Americans as his brother was cycling down a hill, um, and then went on to basically create the the Apollo program. Yeah, they, they essentially got Americans to the moon, didn't they? In, yeah, yeah. In, a, in a nutshell. Um, yeah. Now, amazing stuff. You know, it, and it, so as I say, controversially, it is. 30 and the men of 30 often they claimed that they were responsible for finding the the von Braun's um and they were responsible for getting them out of the the soviet sector but politics being what it was and the agreements between the allies being what it was you know it was always going to be the americans that were going to have them mm. um, and this accidental meeting of the brother on the bicycle by a, a, an american unit who happened to have a german speaker at the front of it was all stage managed, you know, to explain how how these how these men had ended up in the in the in the arms of America, if you like. Wow, fascinating story. Um, and we're gonna we'll do before we do the last we will do the last two points because we've got we, we've started so we'll finish. But an interesting <laughs> question from Sean Brennan, which is about the risk of capture, in that if you're finding out information, that the more information you as a naval officer with it with the team would have is that if you're captured then you could then aid the axis so how how does it organize in terms of sending men into the field who the risk of them being captured and giving more information to the enemy how was that accomplished or how was that re resolved 
yeah so i think as with a lot of these you know that that is a high risk and it's probably one of the reasons it's certainly one of the reasons why fleming was never allowed um to be part of any frontline operations it, you know he was specifically ordered not to to be part of the Dieppe raid even though he he watched it from one of the one of the ships because he'd been indoctrinated he knew what the enigma secret was so he couldn't be risked um and i i i'm pretty certain that within 30 au very few of them would have known what enigma was what the ultra secret was this is the machine that you're trying to find these are the code books listed like this that you're trying to find you know but not with any reason as to why you're trying to find them yeah so it's not a case of right you need to find this because we're going to send it to bletchley because they can then read the messages and then that's going to give us an advantage it's, it's it, so the, going back to the shopping list analogy individually the things on the shopping list don't necessarily make much sense to the person going around the supermarket but back yeah. back back else back to the behind the scenes that information can be relayed forward so you're you're looking for things that you don't necessarily know what the benefit of knowing that thing would be you know so yeah, yeah. that makes sense so the guy um the, the the navy officer to the bottom right there commander bacon he was the direct link between um nid and 30 and bletchley park so you know he was the he was the the man who was in the know, but he was quite safely ensconced at Plexi Park, so there was no danger of him, of him getting it, giving right. it out anywhere. Cool stuff. So we've got well, the, the next one is um, so the Italian adventures, isn't it, or Italian adventure? And then the last yes. one is about about a certain super spy that we're all familiar with. We'll do, <laughs> we'll do Italy Italy adventure first. Okay, so um, we're gonna we're gonna jump back to sort of 1943, and at the end of 43, the the Navy and the Marine side of 30 are recall to britain as we talked about earlier but the army side are left in situ in italy and they sort of take on the, regain the title of special engineering unit um and they operate alongside the allied units in in italy so they're they're some of the first troops into into rome they they blow the safes in the german embassy the photo to the left there is one of their officers in the cellars of the german embassy which was stacked with ammunition and weapons um they take part in the the taking of florence and they had four targets in, in florence one of which was an affair training school um and they work alongside the new zealand and the south african divisions there um and then finally they operated alongside the sas and the italian partisans up in northern italy throughout the rest of 1945 um and that was more of a recon and an observation role and a bit of sabotage. Uh, there was a plan to, to capture a high ranking uh, SS officer, but it never, never got off the ground. But 34 Troop are sort of the, the forgotten relative of, of 30, if you like. They, they, they still carried on. They, they still continued the work that they'd been doing, um, but not perhaps as glamorously or as successfully as they're their naval counterparts in northwest europe but i think it's important that you know we, we know about them when we know that that they were part of the unit yeah and again reflects this idea of the fact they were a kind of a global phenomenon and and which leads me nicely in terms of global phenomenons to um to, to james bond we talked about ian fleming of course the author and this is the whole idea of how much of a connection, if any, does 30 AU have with actual the creation of the world super spy? Yeah. And I think so one of the things I I found as I'm as I'm doing all this and, and you, you obviously be, you you become attuned to 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 the, these various things and you know often it'll come up in the news, oh this was the real life bond or this was who James Bond was based on or you know this is who Fleming did. And the real truth probably looking at it all is that Bond is just an amalgamation of people who Fleming met or heard about or came across in his in his intelligence work. You know, he worked alongside SOE, SIS, combined ops, he's his own commando unit. You you can't pin it on one individual. But what you can do is you can see elements of 30 story that appear in the Bond novels. And you can see that, yeah, there was inspiration. There was connections he was making connections between 30 and and bond even if it wasn't a direct this is who james bond is so for instance you've you've got 
um, in Moonraker, uh, in his novel Moonraker, it's very much about V weapons. It's about rockets, you know, and that ties in with the the, the hunt for the V weapons that that, that thirty with you. It, there's a, a Spectre machine in From Russia with Love, which is very obviously and an Enigma yeah. machine, you know. So that there's that tie in. Um, some of the characters, uh, so. Um, Tony Hugill, who was a lieutenant in the Navy, he appears um, he's an, as a character in Man with the Golden Gun. Um, uh, Volta appears as Drax's assistant in Moonraker. Um, Harling, Lieutenant Commander Harling, he appears in, in Thunderball. Um, and M, the character of M, is probably the one that you can identify as being based on a person, and that was, that was the, the director of naval intelligence who recruited Fleming, and that was uh, Admiral Godfrey. You know, it, it's very much obvious that that's who he based that person on. But, but even when you said earlier that Fleming signed his name with an F, F, M, there's little little connections. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I first read the James Bond books when I was a, well, almost a kid, really. And I reread a couple a couple of years ago, having read lots of books by people like Ben McIntyre and David O'Keefe and things like that. And you realize names pop up and characters yeah. pop up, you know, that Vespa from Casino Royale is a bit like one of the five double agents in Germany. There's a Colonel Strangeways in Dr. No, I think, and there was a Strangeways. So you you see these little, none of them are clear-cut characters dropped in. There's just a little bit of that. It's a jambalaya. It's a mix of things there. But clearly, as you said, you know, that the fact we've got that photo there sitting behind a desk, he did an awful lot of sitting behind a desk in World War II, didn't yeah. he? I mean, doing brilliant stuff. But he, as, as we thought about, he wasn't out there slashing the throats of German sentries and jumping, you know, rappelling down cliffs. And being, he was a, 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 an ideas man who things passed across his desk, which led to him these ideas like seeds just forming there that, that out of which the, the bond novels and films came yeah um yeah and it's, it's there's a there's a, the one story we haven't mentioned yet is that so james bond obviously has this license to kill the double o is a license to kill um and there is a there's a story that when glanville finds the the three admirals the three german admirals in in, in tambach fleming issues an order that um you know the admirals are to be are to be shot, um, and Glanville just flatly refuses at that point. You know I'm not going to do that sort of that sort of thing, and that just sort of touches on the idea of a license to kill. You know that, that Fleming thought it was okay to issue these orders to to execute basically mm. prisoners of war. No, it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating. I mean, and, and David O'Keefe has 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 been bashing away with the messages admiral godfrey hated the m comparison and yeah. he you know the hotel modern and hotel hotel arcades is in goldfinger apparently and so on and so forth you know and yeah and, and you could you could fill a football stadium with all the people who have been suggested as the inspiration for for james bond christopher lee comes up all the time doesn't he because he was involved in intelligence work with the ref and things in the, in the desert so yeah it, it's one of those things you can draw connections all the way through there but as, i think i like this point that david o'keefe made there is that fleming himself wasn't james bond but neither was he a faceless ineffective uh naval bureaucrat he was a he was a, a Svengali behind the scenes, but and, and the desk he flew was an incredibly, if we're going to carry on the desk, an incredibly important asset to the war. But he, no, he wasn't actually, you know, strafing enemy positions and, and knifing German sentries. It was a, it was a job that was being done behind the scenes, that, but very important. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. So I mean, we could do it. In fact, if you give me the idea for doing a show, we'll have a panel discussion with shows where historians we all come on and give, and we 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 decide who is the most likely candidate for James <laughs> Bond. We have David O'Keefe on other commander, and we kind of bash it out over a couple of beers and try and decide who the most likely candidate is. Of course, we'd never get there because, as we said, it's an amalgamation. But. Um, to bring things to an end, so what are you what you you said you you would like to eventually get a museum for your collection of 30 AU stuff? You've got the website, you've got the Facebook uh, uh, group. Um, obviously, you're not going to meet many veterans these days because those, those that window is, is just about closed now. But what's the future for you and for the group and for the study of the of the of the, of the unit? So uh, basically, I mean, it's one of those things where uh, a couple of years ago I thought we'd found the very last. Um, member of the unit, a guy called Bill Marshall, who I got to, to know fortunately and got to know his family very well. 
sadly he passed away in in may 2020 um and then it was just a few weeks later that we found tom bowman over in in canada so we found you know we found that there was another surviving vet and then literally the other a couple of weeks ago i was doing some googling research and found that um there was a a newspaper article from a guy who thought he was the last veteran and he was 20 miles down the road from me in, in Warrington, um, wrote to his family, got in touch with them. Sadly, he's suffering from um, late stage dementia. But again, he's, he's got a, a scrapbook and so on that his, his daughter's going to let me have a look at and, and maybe you know get copies of. Where, where to next with it? I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's this year is the 80th anniversary of the, the unit being created. Um, so we've got a couple of events um, set up in, in Amersham and Littlehampton, the two headquarters of it, um, tying in within Littlehampton in their Armed Forces Day and uh, Amersham with their Heritage Day. Sadly, it was going to be in conjunction with the with the current 30 Commando because 30 was re was resurrected in 2010. Um, the Royal Marines created a, an intelligence exploitation unit, um, and in honour of 30 AU, they named it 30 Commando. Um, sadly, events in the last few days have, have meant that that's, oh, probably, God, yeah. that's probably not now going to happen. Um, and, you know, just getting more of the the stories out there, but the stories of the men, not necessarily perhaps the stories, the narrative of what they what the unit did. I think that's been already told. And there isn't really probably anything to add to that. What we can add to it is putting some of the, the ordinary men that, that did these extraordinary things out there. Yeah. I mean, if, if ever a unit had an array of characters, it, it was this one, wasn't it? And, you know, we've, we've, we've highlighted a few of them and I'm guessing there's going to be dozens of these guys. And, yeah, and it, you know, when people say, what is there still to talk about on your channel, mate? Why would you, you know, how can you possibly think of five subjects a week to talk about? Hasn't it already been said a hundred times before? No, it hasn't. Yeah. There's lots more to say. There's lots more to understand. There's lots more to develop in terms of our understanding of this. And tragically, just be, just be, it's it's interesting and, and and sad at the same time that on the, on the day of the news we've had today, we're still looking backwards, but we're looking backwards in order to look forwards. And it's interesting to Twitter today has been full with full of you know appeasement stories and Neville Chamberlain and and 1930s discussions between various countries and. You know that we're we're accused as historians of being focused on the past, but actually the the past has such huge bearing yeah. on the present and unfortunately the future. So it's uh it it yeah, days no, like today's remind us of the seriousness of what we're doing. Yeah, and it, as I say, you know when it starts to hit home, when you know you get you get those messages and you you suddenly realise that things that you thought were were not going to be affected at all you know, suddenly you're affected and you realise that the implications, the wider effect that this this sort of thing has. But even with with my research on 30, you know, things are still coming to light. I, I got some some documents recently from the archive and there's a whole diary of the unit uh, in operation in, in Corsica. And fascinatingly, some of the diary has been cut out. Um, you, you know, it's been censored at some point and that just adds another question as to you know why why, is it, why, why is it, who, what we yeah 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 is that that yeah you know, as you said we said it earlier that the light at the end of the tunnel just when you think it's getting closer it gets further away because one one answered question asks two more questions and you yeah, know and, exactly. and as, as david o'keefe knows with his enigma and dieppe and pinch raid work is that you know it, it never stops. The, the the book is out, but the research continues, and the, and the archival understanding continues. The, the, you know, there, there's no such thing as well. That one's put to bed. Then let's put it <laughs> yeah. in the cupboard. It just carries on because you're constantly trying to get more information out there. And anyway, so well, um, well, basically, will you come back and talk about Western approaches uh, at some point because it's their yeah. 80th anniversary this year, isn't it? And so it was our it was our 80th anniversary last, last year of the, of the opening, uh, and it's the. The 80th sort of anniversary of the Battle of the Atlantic next year, but Western approaches, yeah, home of the the, the fight against the U-boats and the control of the, of the convoys. Um, that's my that's my day job. Um, so yeah, I would love to come back and, and talk about you know 
what their role was in the war and and how yeah, they, yeah, just we'll we'll, we'll 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 make it so uh, as um, and we'll do that so I'll, I'll just remind me what we got coming up and i'll say goodbye in a second so folks one more show that's strictly part of special forces week which is tomorrow evening so jennifer jennifer grant is joining us to talk about the polish element of number 10 inter allied commando so another another unit that was that was born out of a need for something different in world war ii and then we've got our two parts talking about Operation Biting, the Bruno Val Raid. So Damien Lewis is joining us on Saturday evening to talk about the French resistance and spy work that went into the understanding where this radar facility was north of Le Havre in France. And then the next day on Sunday afternoon, this is GMT time, Neil Cherry is joining us to actually take us through the raid onto Bruno Val, which will be on the 80th anniversary. So that was fantastic. I was up there yesterday filming some footage at Brunavel, which we'll be incorporating into Sunday's show. And then Monday, it all starts off again with reenactment week, which I'm just putting the kind of final touchings, touches on those shows. So if you are new to the channel or if you're not new to the channel, please click subscribe. Please make sure you've got the bell clicked so you get the notifications. Uh, the link to Dave's um, Facebook group, uh, well, the, the website is in the description below and you can get from that to the Facebook group. I urge you to go out there and look at that and look at the resources there. And basically, thank you for being with us again today. Our, our second part of the double bill. And Dave, thank you very much. Um, there's some Thanks people, so as, as we predicted, there's some Americans who, who came into this knowing nothing about the unit. And there's other people who did know a bit about it. But every one of us, myself included, have learned lots. So uh, job done. So job done. Uh, Permission to go and have a beer, Dave. I'm giving, I'm granting you as host permission to go and have something. Thank you. So cheers, everybody. This is Paul Bernard for World War II TV saying I'll see you all again tomorrow. Cheers. Bye.